My mother's name is uh, Florence uh, uh, Walker. Now, her uh, maiden name was Marriott, M-A-R-I-T-T-E, Marriott. And uh, my father is Isaac James Walker Sr., yeah. And he was uh, the third child of, his, of Chloe, my grandmother, and uh, Joseph uh, Lewis Walker, uh, my grandfather. Uh, uh, my father was born in uh, 1899 uh, in, uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. And my mother was born in uh, 1906 in Goldsburg, North Carolina. I didn't know too much about her family. I believe she was orphaned and uh, lived um, in an orphanage. Uh, up until probably uh, around uh, 18 years because that's when she and my dad met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My dad was a traveling salesman for, a, a, a model matter of fact, <laughs> for uh, shirts and collars that were detachable. It had to be around six of them traveled around uh, from Chicago, Detroit, all down through Ohio. I remember they used to have postcards. Which about, yeah, it was about six of them traveling in, in the cars, in this car, uh, because uh, quite a few of the fellas my father kept in touch with. And uh, every now and then, uh, one of them would show up in Atlantic City during the summertime, which is uh, uh, quite a fam world-famous playground, a resort town. Uh, and they were always welcome uh, there. My mother uh, was a, uh, a waitress in Philadelphia at Miss Rawls uh, restaurant down in South Philadelphia. And I had a chance to go there with my family and have breakfast there with Miss Rawls. Uh, and my father and the fellas met uh, her and my aunt, uh, Aunt Ella, uh, who came up uh, out of North Carolina with my mother to Philadelphia. Uh, I think they had traveled up there and they lived uh, on Master Street in North uh, Philadelphia. I met the lady that they stayed with. It was... Uh, 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 they, they, uh, these uh, young ladies stayed there on, uh, at this house. But anyhow, um, my father and these fellows had uh, either breakfast or dinner there at, at this restaurant for several times. And for some reason or another, my father uh, found out where my mother and Aunt Ella lived <laughs> and went over to see them. <laughs> and uh, when she came, my mother answered the door. And she said, oh, you are Isaac, yeah. She said, oh, you come over to see Aunt Ella? Aunt Ella was a tall, good-looking, beautiful, uh, very fair skin. You would believe he was a Caucasian. Uh, and he said, no, I came to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and they got to be good friends. And he stayed on in Philadelphia. Uh, and I think that they uh, went down to Atlantic City on... Um, uh, which was a, quite a resort town to go down to. And uh, they I got married, and they moved back to Atlantic City. And at that time, my father was had decided uh, that he was going to stay there and but go to uh, a dental technician school. I think that was my first date in New Jersey... Uh, it was, we, uh, my classmates, uh, and I, we started off, uh, kindergarten together, and as a matter of fact, we went all the way through, uh, the 12th year of high school together. Uh, but I can remember, uh, around, uh, the sixth grade, 
uh, we decided to form a social club. Uh, we call it the Camp Social Club. And uh, the, all these fellas and I, uh, we uh, formed the club actually to be uh, just uh, together, together. And uh, we uh, had uh, dates with all uh, the girls in, in our class or, or the class below us. So we uh, started dating each other around 12. Uh, yeah, we were around 12, 11 or 12 years old. And we used to go ice skating uh, uh, and all to the movies. Uh, and Atlantic City was quite popular during that, that time. Um, we were too young to work at that time, so we ended up on the beach uh, during the daytime and on the piers dancing with, with all the girls at night. So nobody stuck with one girl at that time. <laughs> you know, and we, I think we would go through, uh, I would have a girlfriend for a week or two weeks, and then somebody else would have her for the next week or two weeks. And our main thing was to dance and, and to have formal uh, get-togethers. We were called jitterbuggers. And uh, we uh, did uh, the swing dances that were quite popular during that time. And uh, I think that we all, all the fellows uh, and I uh, would uh, try to see who could get the, the rest of everybody to make a circle around you while you're dancing with a particular party partner. And uh, there were a couple of young ladies that and we uh, we danced quite well together, so we could put on we could re really put on a show together, and we danced on the pier or at the YMCA, uh, and we had the big bands at that time, the big swing band. Glenn Miller was our favorite, one of our favorite. We had the long zoot suits. As a matter of fact, we had uh, peg pants and. The, the pants would go down from from the knee down to from the waist. waist most of our waist was around twenty eight or eighteen, but at the at the bottom, were, the pants would be uh, cuffed down to almost thirteen inches around you. <laughs> we had long uh, uh, chains, long uh, gold chains, and. Uh, they go down below from your waist, from one side of your waist, underneath your knee up to the other <laughs> side. We had a little pork pie hat at, at that time. I think the first one of us, when it, uh, it started disappearing from our uh, card games or, or what you call them, all of a sudden one fella got real serious. But most of the rest of us weren't serious about anyone until, uh, up until after we went off to the service and came back. Uh, we were all seven, 18 at that time. Uh, and we were away from home. Uh, and the, most of the people that you were associated with were normally older than you. So you, uh, you grew up real quick. We were uh, at the age of uh, wanting to see things, mm -hmm. you know. We weren't serious about anything at that, 18 and 19, you know. I was in, um, uh, uh, I was at, yeah, at the air base in Lincoln, Nebraska, and they moved. Uh, we used to go to, uh, as I said, we used to be quite social at the UFO, you know, and we, uh, the fellas started looking at some of the younger fellas, saying, oh, you guys don't know what you're doing. But uh, we were picked to, to go around and show off uh, at other places. And they moved a, a detachment of wax, which were the, the women uh, Air Force uh, auxiliary group. They moved them from uh, Des Moines, Iowa to Lincoln, Nebraska. And a young lady uh, from New York introduced me to a young girl from Ohio, named R.G. Jones, and R.G. and I became quite good dance partners. 
but she and I stuck it out for about eight or nine months so that we really became real close, oh. you know. Uh, we lost track of each other until after I got out of the service, I was able to get a hold of her. She had gone back to Ohio, and uh, 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 I had to, uh, we, we corresponded for a little while then, but we never got back together again. Mm -hmm. uh, USO and the beaches were segregated, yes. Uh, 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 the beaches in Atlantic City, uh, the beaches in front of all, the, it, it was a resort town and uh, they had the big hotels there and uh, these hotels almost reserved space in front of their places uh, for um, uh, uh, their guests. But there was one section of the beach down in front of Convention Hall and uh, it soon become. They started calling it a, ch a, a chicken bone beach uh, because we'd be down there eating fried chicken or whatever. <laughs> but uh, uh, the blacks went down on that. They, they used to call it colored. That was where all the colored people went down right there next to the pier. But it was one of the ideal spots uh, on the beach, so we didn't mind at all. As a matter of fact, I think that no matter where you were up and down the East Coast or even as far inland as, as Detroit or Chicago, if you were to, wanted to meet somebody and you told them that I'll be in Atlantic City during the summer, they said, well, I'll meet you on the beach, you know, <laughs> and you were sure to meet them on there. And all the black entertainers would come down and one of the, uh, the big avenues called uh, 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 Kentucky Avenue, and they had two, three, two or three of the biggest nightclubs there, and all the big entertainers from King Cole to to mm -hmm. all the singers, they showed up there. And Sammy Davis Jr. would be there, and they had the nightclubs going, uh, and the, the girls dancing, and and Billy Daniels would be there singing, you know, his, his Black Magic song. Uh, and Peg Lay Beats, uh, Peg Lay Bates, be there dancing with one one Peg Lay, and he could dance. But you you went to those nightclubs because that was the ideal spot <laughs> to meet everybody. And I thought about uh, just how fortunate I was during that time, because it, just looking at some of the shows uh, uh, during the Depression, uh, I remember a little of it. But as my mother used to say, you don't know nothing about the depression because any time you said you were hungry, you had something to eat, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. We knew blackouts. Uh, we could see the ships uh, on the horizon on the beach. Uh, and, the, uh, and we knew there was trouble out there because oil would be coming up on the beach. You get home and you got to scrape off oil along with the sand, you know. Mm. Uh, but... Uh, uh, there were things that you had your radio. You didn't have a television, but you listened to the radio. Uh, but, uh, and all the school now the schools were segregated, uh, and it, it and we were all in our, our own location. So we had the uh, we had Negro teachers and the principal. And uh, in two of the big uh, 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 schools, uh, and they uh, the, and they were quite good. They were quite responsible. As a matter of fact, they were preparing us for college. The thing about it, uh, those that since we were all going to school together, you didn't know who was rich or who was poor. Uh, and I wonder sometimes when I think about it. Even now, how in the world my father, at, in the early 30s, was able to end up buying me a Lionel train, you know, mm -hmm. and I couldn't remember because uh, he did all this and he loved to take pictures. So I had pictures of me when, when I was a baby. I got pictures of me when I was three years old, you know, my brothers and sisters. I, I don't, I think that. 
he must have learned it from his father and mother because uh, all of all of them, my aunts and uncles were that way. Uh, they uh, traveled uh, and they uh, took care of each other. If anybody was having problems, I think that they, uh, my uh, oldest aunt, aunt, aunt Bernice, uh, used to be, and she was the oldest, but she turned uh, all the big decisions over to my dad so that uh, he were, and he handled everybody real good. And my mother would just take, she just took everybody in anyhow. Yeah, I had to, I had a good pair of parents, you know. Yeah. My first wife, I married a, a young girl out in Spokane, Washington, right after I got out of the service. Um, she was a graduate of, uh, uh, of North Carolina A&T College. Uh, and she was out visiting her aunt. Uh, who and her aunt ran the Uf, uh, USO, and uh, she and I got to be good dance partners, and um, we stayed together, we played together, and we got married out there, and we enjoyed ourselves. And I stayed out there trying to get in school out there in in Seattle. That was I had applied for uh, under the GI Bill to uh, go to. Uh, either Washington State or, or University of Washington, the, uh, they were the ones that I knew most uh, at that time. But I was, that was, now we that was I was staying in Spokane, Washington, which is inland. Uh, we stayed together until uh, uh, I graduated. At, uh, uh, I I don't know. We just I was young and I just we, we just drew apart. My second wife is. Uh, Valencia. Valencia. Yeah, yeah, Valencia. And I met her in uh, Los Angeles when I was working as uh, on Western Avenue in the Ross Medical Center. Oh. At that time, uh, one of her little, one of her daughters, my uh, oldest one, Alicia, uh, had broken her arm, and she was bringing Alicia and uh, Renee and Joseph to the doctor. When when I finally met her, you know, and as I told you that, uh, she get a prescription fill, and I'd be putting my uh, cards in her bag. <laughs> <laughs> her daughter Renee said, "He must like you. That you got an awful lot of cards in this bag." I don't remember when it was, but uh, I remember when she kept coming past. Uh, uh, I started. To, uh, Telling her, uh, wouldn't you like to go out with me? <laughs> I've got a date going out, you know. I think the first time I took her was uh, to this Tuskegee uh, Sweetheart dance. Uh, uh, Tuskegee Airmen were having a, a, a dance, and uh, uh, and we uh, we got together at this dance, and it had to be down uh, in a in a, a nightclub. A uh, dance hall somewhere down in uh, in the city of Los Angeles, down in the, uh, somewhere around First Street, somewhere down there. So we stayed together quite a long time. We had moved out. Uh, she had uh, decided that she was gonna uh, uh, stay with me. She said, "But I'm not gonna do it. not here in Los Angeles." So. Uh, I said, well, I know a place in Pasadena over on, on El Sereno, right on the borderline of, uh, of Pasadena and Altadena Drive. And this young fellow rented me this house. Yeah. And uh, a couple of my friends who I worked with helped me help her to move and because uh, I was working. Yeah. And uh, she and the, and the three kids moved in. And... Uh, and we just started living together, you know, and we stayed there in that little house. And I'd drive back to Los Angeles to go to work. Well, she uh, she was born in Chicago, uh, uh, to uh, uh, and and had her, her father and mother were there. Her mother was from the islands, and her father was from Louisiana. 
and uh, she uh, 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 she went to school in Chicago, and she went to school up in Minnesota or someplace, or uh, her mother center up there. And she had um, uh, she had Alicia uh, just about the time when uh, I guess it had to be. Uh, somewhere in the late 40s when uh, they moved to uh, 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 moved to Los Angeles. And she was just a beautiful, tall, good-looking woman. <laughs> <laughs> I soon found out that she could cook quite well. well that that got... really knocked me out. And let me tell you something. She made everything. <laughs> she made everything. And during the holidays, uh, she made... Uh, she would do uh, chitlins and uh, and everything. So we had um, Isaac the third. Okay. Mm -hmm. He teaches uh, 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 over at Feta, the fashion institute. Oh, that's oh, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's over Back there. Here, okay. Yeah, he just left us now. He comes here and lives here. Oh, he lives here. Yeah, he, okay. moved, he moved back in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had. Uh, the three ch uh, children when, uh, when when I got married, uh, Valencia had the three children. Alicia was the oldest, uh, and uh, she grew up here in this house with me. Uh, from I think from her grammar school days right on through. So she was about uh, ten or eleven when uh, when we got married. Uh, and then there was uh, Joseph Yancey, uh, that was by her first, second husband, uh, by her first husband, Joseph Yancey, and then uh, uh, my, uh, the baby daughter, Renee Yancey. Um, they all grew up, we all grew up together, and that was a good part. <laughs> and uh, they came, went to school here in Pasadena, and uh, John Muir and Elliot, uh, uh, and then they went off to college. Uh, Alicia first went to uh, Pasadena City College, and then she went to Los Angeles um, Southwest, I think mm -hmm. it is. She uh, uh, ended up in um, as a, a social worker for a while, and then later on she worked with me in my drugstore, and uh, that was beginning in 1969 when she came in to the drugstore. Now Joseph was all through school. He played the drums down at John Muir and he was one of the drum corps and he played baseball and uh, finished off there and then he went into the service. The only trouble we had along the line, uh, Joseph and, and Renee were asthmatic mm. and we had to uh, the trouble with that. As a matter of fact, even Alicia had it. Um, she ended up, oftentimes we'd have to hospitalize them either at uh, uh, the hospital that used to be at the north of, uh, in Altadena at the, at the end of Lincoln Avenue. I forget the name of that hospital now, but it was um, for uh, asthmatics and uh, children. I, I think all of them had the idea, no matter what, at the high school, that they'd go right on into college. Mm -hmm. uh, and their professions that they went into, uh, sort of, uh, they, they made up their own mind about that. I never pushed them in one way or the other, except that uh, after high school, you just continued on that, <laughs> that September. <laughs> so you, you told them that they definitely had to go to college? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had all of them to go to college, or at least after high school you had to go on. Yeah. Uh, now Joseph, uh, when he finished off high school, he went into the na Navy, and he stayed there until he was discharged, and then after his discharge he went up to the state of Washington, and he finished off Washington and State. I've seen, seen all my family pass. I'm the last of my particular family. Um, I, and I think uh, it was sad, but uh, when my mother passed, uh, I had brought my mother and father out here to live after my father retired. I bought them a home here, uh, and 
and they, uh, just down the street from where my drugstore was. Matter of fact, my father used to come up every evening to my drugstore until I closed uh, in the evening, and we'd, I'd walk him home or drive him home. He was just down at the, the next block. It was always good to have him up there. Uh, uh, one of the things I have been in my photo album when I was a, first went off to college, I don't know what it was I wanted, but it must have been about $50. And at that time, there was a lot of money. <laughs> and I wrote back, and he wired me back the money and the message in it. And I still have it. it said, don't worry about anything. Your worries are my worry. Love, Dad. <laughs> when they uh, finished off school, and she went to uh, PCC, uh, and um, then she went over to Los Angeles City College, and she got two degrees from there. She has worked as a stockbroker uh, downtown in Los Angeles for the Bank of America. The Bank of America had their own special uh, board, and they would buy stock every uh, all day or every morning while they were open. Uh, and had a very nice job, and she worked downtown there. Uh, uh, in in the financial district, anyhow. Mm -hmm. But then she went back and got another degree, and she she works uh, uh, as, as a, uh, what do they call it? It's where everybody, everybody in the job comes to them. Human resources? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Well, she's ill right now. Oh. But uh, just, but she's, uh, she's ambulatory. She's moving around, but... She has, has been, she's a, a candidate for, of all things, for a liver transplant. Uh, uh, we have, the whole family has gone over to meet with everybody so that uh, 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 Kaiser, uh, that she goes to, uh, had to find out whether or not you were healthy enough or if you stay on the program. Uh, do you have the people around you to help you? Uh, and she has two of her good friends who uh, are with her almost 24 hours. Yeah. Um, they take turns, but she doesn't have the drive anymore. But um, she, uh, she's quite, even though um, she's a candidate in Rochester come, she's still active with uh, her um, niece, uh, and her, uh, who is mentally ill. Uh, she had... Uh, you know, that was Alicia's child. Uh, she had uh, too much oxygen when she was born. Oh. And um, so she's uh, mentally uh, handicapped that way. But um, she had to have a child and she finally got herself pregnant and had a little boy. And uh, uh, Renee, uh, who while she was in school, decided she wanted to change her name legally, so she changed it to Shay Shay. <laughs> Renee, yes. Shay Shay. Shay Shay. S H E. Yeah, S H E. Yeah. <laughs> Shay Shay Renee. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And she had very fine hair like yours. <laughs> and but during the the um, back black movement time, she had a big afro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, natural. Yeah. Yeah. She said, she told me that. She said, how you, did you let me go to school with this all day? Because it was But uh, she and uh, uh, Alicia were quite active. Alicia, I call my uh, 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 my flower child because she and her fiancé, who before he married, Ended up there in uh, uh, San Francisco for that summer season. Oh, for '67, yeah. uh -huh. summer of love. Yeah, so it was that <laughs> summer of love. She uh, had uh, uh, an African name and uh, joined some uh, uh, clubs there and wore all the, the long dresses and all, mm -hmm. everything. And they, so they were active down there at PCC at that time. Okay. How did Valencia tell you that you were going to have a little baby junior? By telephone. <laughs> By telephone? I was across town working. <laughs> and I guess I must have been late or something. Yeah. 
and had me call home. And uh, I got this call, and she said, uh, where are you? <laughs> I said, I'm over here. I, may have, I think I may have been at a club meeting. She just said, I've been dying to tell you I'm pregnant. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> I said, I thought we had enough children, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he was born by that time. Um, we had moved from El Sereno uh, one July the 4th, uh, around 63, 60, yeah, around 1963, uh, I, we, were, I, we were walking or driving home. And a little house had just been built down the street here in the 500 block. And they had a sign on there for rent. I got out, we got out the car and looked. And I said, this house is brand new. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we took the sign home with us. <laughs> so I didn't have too much reference out here. But a friend of mine who was, uh, who had gone to school with me in Atlantic City, mm. I told him about this house, and I said, we want to rent this brand new house. We aren't ready to buy anything. But uh, uh, I told him, Roy, I said, man, but I don't know whether or not we got enough reference. He said, well, I got a good one for you. I, he said, my real estate agent will hold us up. Yeah. A fella named Wolf. Wolf? Yeah, he had an office down on Colorado. Was he so, African-American? No, he was a, a Caucasian fella. Wow, okay, uh -huh. so there yeah. were good white Elderly people once in a while. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, wow. But he and Leroy had become quite friendly. So Leroy took me down uh, that next day, and, and we told him, Mr. Wolf, about this house. He said, well, I'll stand behind you so he get this house. So we moved into it uh, that week. <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. tell me about Isaac's birth. It wasn't too bad because we were... Uh, um, in, we, uh, I was working with Thrifty at that time, so we had a uh, uh, Kaiser, uh, and, and I used to have a driver back when the floor was there, and he, uh, I was working, it had to be a Sunday, because uh, it was a day, I, I had a day off, and on my day off I used to work at uh, other drugstores, mm -hmm. and this particular night, their day, uh, I had uh, I was working at a brand new uh, uh, store out in Ontario. I used to go to one store in Azusa. It was called Whitefront. It was one of the big uh, big box stores. You know, I was at work, yeah, and I got the call that uh, she had gone to the hospital, and that uh, that the baby was born. Uh, that that evening at seven o'clock in Kaiser Hospital, and so uh, here I am way out in Ontario. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so uh, uh, it was all right. She had I don't know who drove her there, but we had quite a few friends out here. And at that time, uh, Valencia had Valencia's mother and stepfather. Uh, they lived across town. He was a magician. I call him. Uh, uh, the magic hair. Uh, yeah. What was his name? Uh, um, Juarez. Juarez. Yeah. His, his, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. He he used to take us out to to Magic Castle. Yeah. Yeah. So we got into that uh, scene. Wow. And she had to, and she, Valencia had two sisters, uh, uh, Juanita, uh, who lived in Los Angeles, and. Antoinette, who also lived in Los Angeles, and they were had yeah, uh, they had just recently gotten married, so we had that little group of yeah. us around. What was your first impression of Isaac? Uh, that sure is a hairy little baby. <laughs> <laughs> had a full head of hair. Oh my gracious! <laughs> yeah. I said, Oh my gracious, we get all that hair. <laughs> but he was healthy. Yeah. Uh, never had any trouble with his health, you know. While the others had the asthmatic, but he was born here in this house. He was born. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah.
and Alicia at that time had had a one year old, so they were real close, you know. And uh, she had a boy, and and he would come here. Matter of fact, they I raised both of them right together. They had mm. pictures of them. People they used to think they're twins or whatever. Joseph, Jimmy, uh, Lewis. Yes. That was his name. Took him a long time to get his act together from here to Washington to Alaska on a fishing boat. As a matter of fact, this weekend he said he said that it took me almost fifty years to get my act together. He said, but I think I got it. <laughs> he recently got married again to a young lady who used to live across the street from us. Wow. So <laughs> yeah. The she, uh, mm -hmm, yeah, Ursula. And uh, they, uh, I think they've been married about uh, about three or four years now. I came here in uh, 1960. Uh, I was on vacation from my job back at the uh, National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C. And uh, I had the four weeks vacation coming. And I decided uh, after the last big snowstorm back in D.C., that I wanted to live someplace else for. I was just tired of the snow and having them put on all this clothes and everything <laughs> to go down and get in the car. That was the reason. It was, I was young and I'm just graduating. I was a bachelor, so I just figured I'd come out and look at Los Angeles and San Francisco and Hawaii. I said, and that'll give me a, a, a week in each place. Uh, I just packed up as much as I could. I, the furniture that I had, I left for my roommate that I had back there. And uh, the car we had, I had, I gave it to him. And I caught the, I put everything in, in that I wanted to carry in a duffel bag that I had from the service. And uh, caught a plane and came on. I flew, I flew out nonstop. So uh, I was enjoying every bit of this. I had been to the East Coast, I had been to uh, Spokane, Washington uh, prior, uh, several years prior to that, but coming to Southern California was something brand new. And to get here and to see how lovely the weather was and, and how nice and friendly the people were, I just loved it and said, well, I don't have to go to San Francisco <laughs> and oh. I don't have to go to Hawaii. So you just ended yeah. up staying yeah. here. Yeah. I, 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 well, the first day and night, and uh, I, I ran into a, a friend of mine who had gone to school ahead of me, and he picked me up downtown Los Angeles and took me out to his home out on Jefferson Boulevard, I remember. The, the address on, on Jefferson had to be around 1000 block because it was okay. east of uh, Crenshaw. But I remember the, the red car went down Jefferson Avenue. Uh, you know, in front of their houses down there. Um, I was red cars. I never had to ride them. Oh, but okay. Thank goodness, because uh, after I uh, after that night with uh, 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 I had dinner with them at the house, and they had uh, quite a few children. I think he, Luther and, and Inez. That was their their names. I, Luther Walls and Inez Wall. Um, I think they had at least four children. Uh, but anyhow, I felt as though I was taking up, and I told him after dinner that uh, I said I don't. Know. I said I think I'd go back down to the Y, you know. And I said, can I catch the trolley out there? He said, no, I'll take you. He said, but I want you to stay here tonight. You can stay here tonight, because they had a two-story house down there uh, mm. on on uh, Jefferson Boulevard. And uh, Jefferson Boulevard was quite busy along that time. They had restaurants and everything else up and down that street. The homes were looking good. The people hadn't moved. Uh, the Afro-Americans hadn't moved past Crenshaw at that time. They hadn't moved into uh, Baldwin Hills or, or, or View Park, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I did that later. I moved. Well, we moved. This couple that I, the Inez took me down that evening to her uh, uh, aunt and uncle who were school teachers and they said yeah you can stay here we got room for you and uh, anyhow Melba Wilson and Bob Wilson both school teachers here we just took to me and we just 
liked each other, and they, Melba just made me part of her family. Oh. So much so that every weekend she had me uh, going some dance or meeting some group of people, some of the school teachers. Oh, that's or right. Some of the, yeah. The you clubs, yeah, candy, some of the right? girls' <laughs> clubs, like the Lynx, and that club, uh, uh, there was a famous club called Jack and Jill's. This was over on, on, on uh, around Adam Boulevard, and uh, uh, they were, uh, they lived all up around through Adam Boulevard uh, on that, uh, uh, that particular area. Yeah, um, but Jack and Jill's, what was that like? That was a beautiful social club, all of them were socialites, the doctors and teachers are going to college, uh, you know. Um, yeah, <laughs> Bud was uh, one of the quiet ones and Melba was outgoing, <laughs> just uh, just bubbling all over the place. And, and Bud was just the opposite. But he, he went along with anything uh, Melba said. And he, he enjoyed having me around too. As a matter of fact, I remember him taking me to um, See the Dodgers play at the Coliseum, <laughs> up and down. I'm a, a Dodger, a Laker, a Clipper, and Sparks. Yeah, I'm a hometown fan, but I got that from my folks back in Atlantic City. My dad and mother used to take us to the local uh, uh, team. It was uh, the Johnson All-Stars on Sunday when he was off. We'd go there and eat peanuts and holler at the pitchers, you know. So all th uh, my three, uh, my two brothers, my brother and sister, and I and my mother and brother, we'd sit there, and then uh, they used to go up to Philadelphia to see the uh, Dodgers play when they were there. Uh, I remember mother seeing Jackie Robinson and Roy Campanella when she beat the man in front of him. She said, <laughs> she's telling Roy Campanella, hit a home run, and he hits a home run. She said, I told you so. <laughs> she did it. Yeah. But they were, he was a big sports fan, you know, so whenever he got a chance on the weekends to go to him, he would go, you know, and take her. They, they, they would go dancing and everything else there. Uh, one of her girlfriends, uh, uh, one of the youngsters in the West going to babysit us. I didn't know what in the world it were babysitting, but I'm glad that they, I look back now and I'm happy that, that I remember her going to see uh, Ella Fitzgerald when she first came out with Chick Webb there uh, in, uh, in Atlantic City. Melbourne introduced me. There was a young fellow down the street. Uh, named uh, Dr. Cranford, a young fellow. He was just a couple of years older than me. Very smart. Matter of fact, I think he I think he graduated from college when he was 18. Uh, but anyhow, Cranford had his own drugstore in a medical center at, at Western Avenue in uh, Adams and Western. There was a medic this medical center, uh, Adams Adams Medical Center that and. Cranford, uh, a uh, Amos Cranford had the pharmacy in there, you know. But he and I got to be friends, and he started taking me around to all the the clubs and everything. And his wife Margie was a singer, and he took me out on the and we went out on the on the sound stage and watched her sing in a, uh, a big musical they were doing. And they, they they did this big musical over on a, on a they had a set over on um, Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood. I I, I want to say it was a, a showboat that they did, mm. but uh, I remember all of them in the costume and singing and everything. But, uh, Margie was, was a good singing and an actress, and um, she didn't let Cranford do everything he did. But he was a good guy. He took care of everybody over there. I mean, when I say everybody, that means that uh, the, he was friendly with uh, the pimps and <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Cranford would take care of you. Yeah. yeah. I knew uh, several doctors who, who had, had their regular medication for, uh, for the, uh, the female patients that came in asking for help. Los Angeles at that time was a closed circuit. Um, uh, the, that particular part of Adams and Weston and, and Washington Boulevard, there were all these big homes in there. Mm -hmm. 
the mayor used to live down there before they moved west, you know, going out towards uh, uh, Hancock Park or, or out to west, uh, before they went into the Beverly Hills. Or something. Just like the guy said, I could have, when I first came here, I could have bought all this land out here for a, a dollar a lot. And he said, but I didn't have the dollar. <laughs> you know, you know. I mean, when you think about it, you know, and Ben Cross and them talking about the scene about San Fernando Valley and, and uh, Jackie Benny talking about uh, Cucamonga, you know, had all these names. Everybody looked forward to all that. You were they didn't right. know it was just country. Oh, I saw quite a few, quite a bit of development. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, this young fellow, Cranford, had contact with everybody on both sides of, uh, yeah. of, of the street. I went to 50 uh, pay raise. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 50 was under, uh, what's that, uh, uh, the union, uh, the retailer's union. And you got good pay, you know, and all the benefits, you know. Well, in the, in the 60s, we had, we had uh, stores, uh, and I and, uh, had our own black managers. Uh, the first one I went into, as I said, was there at Washington and Central. And that was a big one and because at that time, pharmacy was open inside the store so that the store that couldn't, the manager couldn't open that door until the pharmacist got there with him. And when uh, he, he, the pharmacist walked in ahead of the manager even. Yeah. Because that's the only yeah. Now they close them in. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when they finally got around to closing them in. That's uh, and the fifty at that time was owned by the family. Oh yeah, they just have a big lunch counter there. Uh, they serve lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, because we were open until ten o'clock. We were open at eight, and we were open. Would be open until ten o'clock in the evening, and we had. Uh, Two pharmacists, uh, two regular pharmacists, and then we'd have a relief pharmacist for the time when we, when one of us had a day off, mm. and we each one of us worked uh, 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 eight-hour shifts, and the pharmacy was open in the middle of the store, or uh, they didn't put it way in the back at that time, uh, and the big rest, uh, the big. Uh, as I said, this this store at Central and and Washington had a big fountain there. And when I say it, it wasn't just a counter fountain, they had a fountain that was like a big horseshoe, and people sat around uh, and got their lunch and and meals right there. They had the big stores all up and down Central Avenue. Uh, they had the white front stores. They had liquor stores, they had big dance halls, and they had restaurants. I mean, on weekends, you would be busy, you know. But no fighting, you know, nothing. I can remember going up from Central Avenue, you look for a space to park your car, and if you found a space near, near the dance hall there, and the restaurants were downstairs, and they had the, the music halls, and all the musicians up, upstairs, and you'd go up these steps, and people be coming down the steps and you be going up, no fighting, no pushing, you know. And it wasn't no big wide step. You just <laughs> and everybody dressed to a T, you know. But uh, when they had that ride in sixty five, they burnt all of that up and down. They didn't call it Charcoal Alley. That's what they uh, uh, that part of Central Avenue. After I left there, after that, when that store burnt. I went out to, uh, 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 while waiting for them to t call me and place me again, uh, I started working with White Front out in Azusa. Yeah, completely different, <laughs> you know, everything. Still. Uh, yeah, it was, all, it was almost like a big mall. When, you know, people, Azusa at that time, was, you know, was still country out there, you know. <laughs> but, uh, I, but I went to this White Front and I was out there working. And everybody was running in there. I never forget the riots was going on in Los Angeles, and everybody was running in there. Uh, 
getting this old and I said, these people going to kill themselves with all that old ammunition. Mm -hmm. He used to come in there and he said, can we rush it up? And the manager said, we're going to have to close early. I said, the, uh, the riot's coming. I said, the riot, I'm here already. <laughs> Coming from the East Coast, we never knew anything about the internment of, of the Japanese. And, and uh, when, uh, uh, after the riot, uh, when pharmacy, when the 50 finally called me and told me, you don't have to work at Wayfront, we got a store for you. And I went to Boyle Heights out there on Brooklyn Avenue. And the Japanese fellow and I ran it, oh, George y Yamaguchi. He had graduated from SC. But his folks had had a big farm I don't, somewhere down around San Diego, and they lost all of that, you know. And he was telling me how, uh, coming home from school, you know, uh, that uh, they, the friends of theirs in the neighborhood were supposed to be running, helping them, and running the store for them while they were being interned. Uh, they were, well, they sent them out here to Santa Anita, to race mm -hmm. track and everything else. Uh, and uh, the George went into the service as a translator. Uh, he was lucky that way. But uh, he told me some of the, some of the, there were some horror stories. People coming, kids coming home from school and their parents are gone. You know, that's, that's horrible, you know. Mm -hmm. And as I said, in my hometown of Atlantic City, we didn't have any trouble with, with the police. With the, the police on our side, on the north side, um, we, you knew them. Uh, you knew where they lived and uh, they were just part of, uh, of the fact, uh, uh, family. And um, we were fortunate enough, as I told everybody, we had... Uh, uh, a, a lady detective, Miss Cresswell, she, she, if, if you were doing wrong, she found you and come to your house, you know, you know when Miss Cresswell came to your house, you were in trouble. I, and reaching the reunion that I had, we were talking about the Jewish group that lived uptown in the inlet and the Italian fella, uh, he lived in between, but uh, he knew uh, the, the Jewish fellow's uncle, because um, it was a tailor shop, you know, mm -hmm. you remember. And um, we we spoke about how we weren't just segregated, we just went to the school in your neighborhood. And the, and the neighborhood was just where everybody lived. The Italians lived over here, and uh, 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 there were, uh, the Jewish lived over here, and uh, and I think they all worked at the same places, but then they all went off to go, go to their homes. They didn't just socialize with, with each other. But out here, they had uh, everything. Japanese couldn't move into this neighborhood, and the black, you couldn't sell to blacks even if you wanted to, you know. And um, when they finally moved across Crenshaw into Baldwin Hills, they had moved into Lamert Park, which was a nice little one story uh, uh, houses that would look like the houses that you see down in the block down here with the lawn and everything. And they, uh, but that was on the east side of Crenshaw. But when they moved on the, on the, on the west side of Crenshaw and these doctors and lawyers and what's going on, when they had the money to do or move over there in the mid, uh, middle and parts of, of the 60s and the early part of the 70s, they were burning crosses on, on, on people's lawns, mm -hmm. you know, uh, come past. And you'd have your place looking just as pretty as everything. And you'd throw rocks through your villa. I saw uh, instances uh, in, in the Pasadena, uh, especially since uh, during the 70s and 80s, they had a big drug problem all up through uh, the neighborhood mm -hmm. because it was brought on by poverty mostly. You, you had the underlying feeling that it got into you neighborhood for some reason or another because there was an awful lot of money being spent mm -hmm. and nobody was saying uh, the people on Wall Street <laughs> were, weren't using it, but they were. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looked like they were trying to say that the hippies were the only ones doing it and the beatniks mm -hmm. and uh, but an awful lot of the suits were, were out there. 
we had uh, the uh, the Black Panther group that were up, uh, uh, around here. I remember uh, them from their carrying guns down in South uh, 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 South uh, uh, Watts mm -hmm. down in that area because I had worked around that area uh, and the 50 drugstores down in that area. Um, and then up here, um, there was uh, a fellow who started, uh, 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 Karinga was his name. He started, oh, yeah. Yeah, and he, had, he lived right around the corner from my drugstore. And one of my patients was a, a young girl. Uh, She's a she's a tremendous artist, and she got shot up at California Berkeley. Uh, at People's yeah, Park. Yeah. Uh -huh. And oh she was paralyzed from her waist down. Mm -hmm. But she she did, that didn't never stop her from doing her work or something. But she was in tremendous pain all day long. Yeah. But uh, uh, she had to come to the drugstore quite a bit. It's still going on. As a matter of fact, right here in Pasadena, they've been uh, they recently killed a young boy mm -hmm. for. I mean, they pull pull guns out. <laughs> for, I don't understand how they were. I know they got now. They got all this armor from the army surplus. Right. You know? That are yeah. that are yeah. That's a heck of a thing. Have. Yeah, yeah. That's a heck of a thing to be spending money instead to spend money on that rather than School. on computers or books. Yeah. You know. Or medicine. Uh, uh, medicine, right. No, there were people coming out of the South, you know. That South was something else, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, they had places for you and everything, but um, uh, they made you feel small. I didn't have too many incidents. I remember we were in, we were headed for Keys of the Field as, as air cadets, and we had a, a layover in Birmingham, Alabama. And it was about five of us. We were just walking uh, with our, we had our soldier uniforms on, walking down the street uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, not bothering, just looking. And uh, I'll never forget this little boy, had to be three years old, three, four years old, said, look at the nigger soldiers, daddy, look at the nigger soldiers. And my friend, a young fellow, Washington from Massachusetts, God he said, what in the world? He going, I said, man, leave these people alone. I said, you don't know these people. You know? I said, you remember when we came through West Virginia, they made us pull the, the windows down on the coach, uh, the window shades down on the coach when we came through the hills of West Virginia? He said, because the man came and said, they'll be shooting at you. <laughs> from from the, their houses of sitting on the porch where the train come through, and they know when the trains are coming through. <laughs> so he pulled out the window so that the shades so they won't know which coach you in. I had a three day pass uh, from uh, Biloxi, Mississippi to I was going to go over to New Orleans. I wanted I wanted to see New Orleans, and I got on this bus, and uh, all up in front of the bus, you know, the whites were sitting there, and the blacks start from the bus and come forward, and uh, I was standing in the. In the aisle, I thought I was back far enough because I was more than halfway back. That bus driver got out, walked around, knocked on the window, and uh, somebody sitting down there said, hey, uh, Soldier, I think he's knocking for you. And I looked down and said, Yeah. He said, Man, I wasn't back far enough. I'm standing halfway, but I wasn't back far enough. He, and I moved back in the bus, and I said, he said, <laughs> a little bit more, until he was satisfied, you know. And I said, okay, you know, all the way over to New Orleans. But I didn't let it, my mother and father told me, don't let these people bother you. I had had an aunt that told me a long time, my grandmother, the first time we went down to visit her in Norfolk, uh, she asked for the Jim Crow coach before we left Philadelphia so that she wouldn't have to get up and move Call when you got list. down to uh, the, the Mason Dixie line, you know. Now, when you got when I got to New Orleans, uh, I didn't know anybody in, in the New Orleans. My little friend, I was uh, who lives across town, had gone to Xavier, uh, but uh, 
and I heard of St. Bernard's Catholic Church down there. I wasn't a Catholic, but I went to that church because uh, back in Atlantic City, uh, uh, and growing up on Palm Sunday, I'd get up nice and early and go down to Catholic Church because they gave out all this nice, beautiful palm. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah. How cool. So, so when I went to uh, Sunday school at 10 and 11 o'clock at, at my Methodist church, I was ready. I had plenty of, <laughs> I had plenty of palms, you know. But uh, I, I went there to St. The, the Bernard's Catholic Church, and uh, the priest just took me in a hand and uh, introduced me to a, a, a young fellow who was there playing basketball. And this young fellow, he said, take him over, for he's going to be here for the weekend. I went over to their house. He had two pretty girls, two pretty sisters, and we all ate there, had a good time together. And wow. we, we, we corresponded after that, yeah. Well, do you remember the first time you heard about Martin Luther King? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, well, I was out of school by then. Okay. Uh, when, uh, uh, the first time I remember... Uh, hearing about him, uh, I think uh, he, he uh, I think he was doing the, the the big march in in Washington D.C. So sixty three. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Although I did, uh, I was here in Los Angeles at that time, mm -hmm. in the early sixties, and I was able to uh, go to one of his speeches over on Adams Boulevard at, at a church. Oh, that was wonderful. He was, he was quite uh, uh, quite a speech maker. And uh, I'll never forget, he used to say, he, one of the things that he said that stuck with me, he said, a lot of you have come down with the, matter of fact, the, the, the young preacher that his church I used to attend went down south and marched with him. He said, he used to tell them, I, you don't feel bad that you can't come or don't feel as though you can could come. He said, not all, not all soldiers go to war. He said, they got to have somebody behind them in order to, to feed them the ammunition that's necessary for them to go, you know. And it was funny to hear him speak in the morning as though he was preaching in, in a church and then to see him that evening on television or some. In, in in Hollywood or, or in Beverly Hill, uh, using a, a completely different manner of speaking, you know. I think I was working at a drugstore out here on uh, Colorado Boulevard when uh, uh, Martin Luther King got killed. Because uh, I had had the opportunity to hear him one Sunday over on Adams Boulevard, mm. one Sunday morning. He would speak on Adams Boulevard at the churches down there. Uh, on the south side of Central, uh, uh, then in the evening he'd go over on the west side of town, you know, and talk, you know. But uh, he always made you comfortable, but one thing he always said, and not everybody can be on the front line. He said, about, and there were quite a few that left here to go down on the marches and everything. He said, but you want, he always let them know, you don't, shouldn't feel bad when you see some of your friends down there being beaten. Or, or, or that they got on the Freeman bus or train uh, and went down there. He said, well, not all soldiers have to be, he said, you have to have somebody back here to get the ammunition for those to, who mm -hmm. go down there, to give them strength. He said, so when you're back here and if you have fundraisers or your prayers, he said, I remember him saying that. Now when he went out on Wilson Boulevard, when you see it reported in the paper, if he caught any part of his speech, you thought he was talking at Harvard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was quite a he yeah. was quite a speaker, you know. People don't realize that he he could talk. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have one right now. Yeah, it's been yeah. a long time since you've had a, had a leader like that. Yeah, you know? and Bobby when Bobby came up and after Humphrey went down so far, you know, um, in between Johnson and Humphrey with that. Vietnam War, but Martin Luther King knew he wasn't going to live. After, when he came up against the war, yeah. And they never want to talk about that, you know? No. They never that was that. it. Mm -hmm.
because the people, well, Eisenhower, remember Eisenhower, when he did it on his speech, he said, and leaving office, beware the military people in the country. He said, they're the ones who are going to take you down. Well, I was working over around Brooklyn Avenue when they had the ride, when um, uh, Chavez was... Uh, Ruben uh, yeah, Salazar? Yeah. When, when the reporter got shot. Yeah, Ruben Salazar. Yeah, Ruben Salazar. I was over there where I had left the store that afternoon. You know, they were, had that police coming down through there. As you said, it, it was all, just about quieted down. He was in there watching television mm -hmm. in, in this restaurant bar mm -hmm. or whatever. And they sh shot that tear gas canister or something. And um, the articles that he had been writing in the paper uh, supporting the uh, the boycott, the Greek boycott, and and uh, and the wages, and telling, even though everybody knew what they were, really, uh, the migrant workers were being treated, uh, and are still being yeah. treated. And, oh yes, right in your face, mm -hmm. it, it's still doing it. Okay, so what? What? How did you feel about 1963 and the assassination of JFK? Oh yeah, yeah where was I? Yeah, yeah. I, I remember right where I was. I was working as a, a waymaster uh, over in uh, Culver City at a pharmaceutical manufacturing mm -hmm. plant, and I had to, I used to weigh up all the the medicines to uh, to uh, in order to make these pills and capsules and liquids and everything else. And I had to sign. I had to uh, mix everything and sign for each each and every one of those drugs that went in there. But I remember that afternoon when I felt real sad, real sad. Um, I think... Was it a shock? Yes. I think that um, uh, I live, yeah, I was living here on Altadena Drive, uh, on Figueroa Drive, a brand new house down the street. Uh, and I came out that day. You didn't feel like eating, you didn't feel like uh, uh, going anywhere, you know, um, because you... you you just felt as a, why him, you know? It looked like he was going to do so much, you know? Um, you felt almost as bad when Bobby got killed, you know? I, I remember, um, I remember taking a date one Sunday afternoon after church uh, to a big club across, it was on Wilshire Boulevard, across uh, from, uh, 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 the uh, uh, the Palladium, and they had uh, a big circus inside the uh, thing, floors and people coming up and they dance girls and then they have a movie and everything. That was something else, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. I saw I saw Angela uh, Maya Angela when she came down from San Francisco. Oh my God. I saw her on a little street called Virgil Avenue in the little coffee club over there, and. Uh, she was there in this long moo moo or whatever, <laughs> barefooted. She said, You always remember me. She said, This black woman, six foot tall, I'm, I'm six foot tall, barefooted, black, and magnificent. I'll never forget her saying that, you know.